Thank you, everyone, for coming. Uh, I've got, I'm getting over a cold as the coughing, sorry about that. So um, when I was advertising the program, this is uh, what I said we would do. We would begin with a little bit of chanting in English. It takes about 15 minutes, and then I give a short Dharma mm -hmm. talk. The length varies each week, depending on the topic. And then I try to leave uh, plenty of time for a question and answer. And you're welcome to ask me about what I've spoken about on that day or anything related to the Dharma that's, that's on your mind. And I'll do my best to answer. Uh, and then I'll give a short um, explanation of the meditation technique that we do. Uh, it's very simple. And then we do two short periods of meditation, about 10 minutes each, with some walking meditation in between. Uh, but I'll talk a little bit more about that later. So <clears throat> today I wanted to say <coughs> uh, just a few words about karma. Uh, this word has now become part of the English language, but it's not very well understood. Uh, and there are two things that it is not, that people often mistake it for. Karma is not fate. Karma does not mean fate. Our future isn't really predetermined. Um, it isn't what passively happens to us. This is tied to this idea of fate. Karma isn't just what happens happens to us. It's also not a system of reward and punishment. So Buddha isn't sitting up somewhere in some heavenly abode uh, looking down at us saying, um, you have pleased me, so I will reward you. And uh, you have upset me, so I will punish you. Buddha does not do that. Enlightened beings do not pass judgment. They don't give us reward or punishment. Uh, and so Buddha doesn't send us to the different realms. You know, these, these six realms in which we can be reborn. So there are the hell realms, uh, hungry ghosts, animals, human beings, and then there are either the demi gods or fighting gods. Sometimes they're called the fighting gods. And the higher gods, right? These are the six realms into which we can be reborn. Buddha doesn't send us there. Uh, we create the causes to be reborn wherever we're born. Now, a lot of um, um, Buddhist traditions have some sort of story after you die that there is someone who, who meets you and uh, tells you where you're going to go. Do you have that in Vietnamese Buddhism also? Have you ever heard of that? Well, in, I know in the Japanese tradition there's a witch who's sitting in a tree. And when you come along after you die, the witch takes all your clothes and then says, this is where you're going to go, that's where you're going to go. And so there's a pilgrimage that you can do in Japan for Pante Amboka. And people who do this pilgrimage, um, not always but often, one of the things that they will bring with them is a white vest, a sleeveless shirt. And on the back, uh, I think on the front also, um, when you go to each of these temples, um, they do some calligraphy in Chinese, and there are some red stamps that they put on it too. And so when you pass away, they put you in this um, this vest if you have one. And if you have that when you meet the witch, um, she doesn't take your clothes. So, you know, there are these kind of folk traditions. Different Buddhist traditions have these different traditions about exactly what happens after we die. But in fact, the witch isn't actually judging anyone. Even in this folk tradition, the witch isn't judging anyone. She's just showing you your own karma. The Tibetan tradition talks about Yama, the lord of death. And if I recall correctly, he doesn't judge anyone. He just shows you your own karma. So, <clears throat> so karma. So we we create the causes to be reborn wherever we're born in whatever circumstances we're born in. Uh, related to this idea of reward and punishment, um, not too long ago the, the Dalai Lama was being interviewed and he was asked about um, New Orleans and Hurricane Katrina. And they said, well, why did this happen? And he said his answer was basically karma. And a lot of people got upset because they thought he was saying those people in New Orleans were bad in a past life, and so they were being punished now. Well, no, karma isn't just what happens between, or that you know, jumps between lifetimes. It's not just that. It's also what we do in this life. Most of the karma that we create in this life, we experience the results of that karma in this life. So when the Dalai Lama was talking about karma, he was probably, what he was probably talking about was the fact that, well, there were people who chose to live in New Orleans, and 
there was this levee system, the dams that were supposed to protect them, that weren't adequate. They weren't very good, and people knew that, but nobody did anything about it, and then the hurricane came, and the levees failed, and it was a big mess. That's, that's a big part of that karma right there. It's not about reward and punishment. It's just cause and effect. So here, action is what the word karma actually means. The term karma means action. But we're actually talking about actions and their results. <coughs> and we create karma through the body, speech, and mind. So we talk about thoughts as actions, a kind of action, mental actions. <coughs> so we create body, uh, karma through body, speech, and mind. And part of our karma is the tendency to repeat certain actions. So, um, uh, some of you have heard me say this before, if you want to learn how to play the violin, the first time you pick it up, you start to play and it sounds terrible, right? Because you don't know what you're doing, but you repeat it again and again and again, and you get better and better and better at it. It's the same thing with everything that we do. When we repeat certain kinds of actions, we get better at it. Whether it's actions that lead to suffering or to happiness, it doesn't matter. So. If we have the, the tendency to respond with anger to uh, different kinds of situations, if we just respond with anger, then we're creating a stronger habit for anger. So part of our Buddhist practice then is learning to break those negative habits, those habits that cause suffering and go in a different direction. So as I said, we also describe karma as cause and effect. And here I said karma is a dynamic system because there are countless causes leading to countless effects. Only a perfectly enlightened Buddha can know exactly what someone's karma is. Only a perfectly enlightened Buddha can see, well, if you do this, this will absolutely be the result. Sometimes we can see it. We see it with people we know. I think maybe sometimes it's easier to see these kinds of patterns in other people than it is to see them in ourselves. We look at our friends, our family members, maybe you've got a brother or sister, and you know that they just, they always make the same mistake again and again, and it always makes them suffer, but they do it again and again, no matter what anyone tells them. So sometimes we can see really obvious patterns, but really, only a Buddha knows perfectly uh, exactly what causes lead to what results. So it's also dynamic in that how I respond to a situation isn't just an effect of past karma, but also creates a new cause. So someone says something mean to me, um, and I respond with anger. It doesn't end there. The fact that I responded with anger means I'm strengthening that habit to get angry again in the future, so I've created a new cause. Or someone says something mean to me that I think is mean, and I get angry, but they didn't mean it that way, but then they get angry, and then our relationship breaks down, and we don't talk to each other for a year. So you can see it's this constant series of causes and effects and causes and effects. <coughs> so, as I said earlier, we create the causes for our own experience. And so, as Buddhists, it's very difficult for us to say, why me? When something bad happens, it's difficult for us to say, why me? Because I created the cause for whatever I experienced. But then the Buddha also taught compassion. So, we don't ever look at someone else and say, um, you're suffering, so it's your fault. Shut up and put up with it. But why not? We don't do that. Because the instant that we do that, the instant that we start to blame, we're not practicing compassion. And when we're not practicing compassion, we're not practicing the Buddha's teachings. Even if we can look at someone, oh yes, please. Even if we can look at someone and see uh, how they have obviously created their own suffering. We don't, there's no reason to be mean about it. So we can definitely look at someone and say, oh, well, I see you know, this friend of mine, um, this is how they've caused themselves suffering. Well, 
I don't want to do that. I don't want to use them as an example for my behavior then because I don't want to suffer this way. That's fine. But being mean about it, getting up in their face and saying, ah, oh, shut up, you whiner. <laughs> We're not practicing the Dharma the instant that we do that. So we can take responsibility for our own karma. That, that is skillful. That's a good idea. When I suffer, I can say, okay, I created the causes for this. And in that way, I'm motivating myself uh, not to make the same mistakes again. But when I look at someone else, saying that to someone, especially if they're really suffering, can be really mean. Now, a really skillful person might be able to look at a friend of theirs or a family member who's suffering and say, well, you know, you did X, Y, and Z, and that's why you're in this situation. You know, somebody really skillful can do that without blame. And that might be really useful for that person. But we have to be very careful. <clears throat> now, this is something interesting. Uh, one of my favorite Buddhist authors is, uh, his name is Shantideva. And he, he, was, he lived in the ninth century, so over a thousand years ago. And he taught um, that when, for example, when I die, my name is Kwe Hai, right? When I die, I'm done. Kwe Hai is gone. Kwe Hai is not reborn in a new life. What does go from lifetime to lifetime is just our consciousness and the imprint of our karma, basically the habits that we've created, those basic underlying habits. But my personality, the personality that is quite high, is gone. I always joke about how I, I love uh, chocolate. Today I decided to run out quick for lunch and I had a, I had a piece of chocolate pie with my lunch. That's one of my habits. And this is my result. <laughs> this is the karma of my love of chocolate. But that, that, that doesn't mean in my next life that you know, my reincarnation, quote unquote, will have this attachment to chocolate. For all I know, I could be reborn um, a woman farmer in Uganda. I don't know. Nobody knows. I could be reborn a wealthy man in China, some real estate baron in China. I don't know. So if we think about it that way, that it's really this, this person who is supposedly our reincarnation is really a different person. In a very real way, they are a different person. But karma still, some of that karma still transfers from lifetime to lifetime. So if I think about it, the causes that I create now in this lifetime, that if I don't experience the effect completely in this lifetime, it passes to the next. I'm subjecting this new person to suffer the results, the consequences of my actions. Think about that. Maybe um, as kids, um, you had the experience, maybe you did something bad, but someone else got blamed for it and got in trouble. Do you know what I'm talking about? And then you feel really bad about it. I remember my dad tells this story. He has a younger brother and a younger sister. And he got in trouble. My father was the oldest. And he got in trouble for leaving my grandfather's tools outside. And so they got all rusty. But it really wasn't him. It was his younger brother. And so my dad got, he was getting in trouble for it. He says, I swear it wasn't me. I swear it wasn't me. And so, you know, his family was Christian, so he ran and got the Bible, and he put his hand on the Bible, like they do in court, and he said, I swear on the Bible it wasn't me. So then he got in trouble for swearing on the Bible, which is apparently something his parents didn't want him to do. It was actually his younger brother who left the, the tools out. My father is still a little upset about that, jokingly. I mean, they joke about it when they get together. So my uncle saw that my father was getting in trouble, but he didn't say anything. I don't know if he felt bad about it. But imagine, that's, that's essentially what we're doing. When we create negative karma, if we don't experience the suffering in this life, if we don't purify that karma in this life, then someone else, very much a different person, will have to suffer the consequences. Now, whether or not we believe that is literally true or not, it doesn't matter. 
That is a skillful view to hold, a skillful belief to motivate us to avoid creating negative karma. Does that make sense? We can't know for certain. I have no scientific proof. There's no evidence uh, that I can show you in a box that will say that you know what I've just said is absolutely true. But if we think about it, it's a skillful way for us to avoid creating negative karma and to encourage us to follow the Buddha's teachings so that we can avoid causing suffering for ourselves now and others in our lives now and others in the future as well, including our so-called reincarnation. But the key thing uh, to keep in mind, therefore, in kar with karma is compassion. We need to have compassion for our future births. We need to have compassion for other people around us because a lot of what we do, it doesn't just cause us suffering, it causes them suffering as well. But also, we are on the path of the Dharma. It's not like you go for refuge and boom, your mind is different. Suddenly, all your behavior is perfect all the time. That's not the case. So we need to have compassion for ourselves as well. I guarantee, if you follow this path, you will fall down. You will smack your head on the ground more than once. The thing is to just recognize when we have fallen off the path, when we are not acting uh, in accordance to the, with the Buddha's teachings, and simply to get up and try again, and try again, and try again. Just that act of trying to correct our mistakes is itself very powerful karma. We're, we're creating the strong habit of trying to correct our mistakes. So we need to have compassion and patience for ourselves as well. So that's all I have to say. So now I'll, I'll open it up and see if anyone has uh, any questions. And again, you can ask me about this or anything that's on your mind. Yes. You're talking about the economy, uh, the, uh, the economy and the happiness, uh, the Dalai uh, uh, Lama, talking about the karma, but uh, like the before, you think about the economy also. That's it, maybe a collective karma. Mm -hmm. Just being together to, 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 to suffer some sanity. So, yeah. yeah, well, there is that. I mean, there is some of that karma from, from the past as well. So, now Akbar here was talking about collective karma. Um, so, we create similar causes to experience similar results. For example, the existence of this world is the result of our collective karma. We have the collective karma. We have created similar causes, and so we are experiencing this similar world. But then we have our individual karma. So our specific individual experience of this world is different from one another. Same thing with the situation in Katrina. So people have this, this uh, collective karma to experience that event, but their individual experience was all slightly different because of individual karma. But to say, to say that again is not about blame. I want to really stress that point. It's never about blame. Just recognizing the fact of cause and effect. Other questions today? Yes. Um, um, the last one, mm -hmm. when you mentioned um, our consciousness will be imprinted with our, like, within the new person, but not our habits. What do you mean by that? What's, what's consciousness, what's the difference between consciousness and our, like, habits, like, you know, our behavior? Mm, okay, so consciousness is just, this is really difficult to explain, actually. Consciousness is really just the bare ground of awareness. And then on top of that, we have, um, Perception, well, feeling, right? Perception, and then our thoughts about what we're perceiving and feeling, and then what we do about it. But you strip all that away, and there's just a bare awareness. 
imagine, this is not a really good analogy, but imagine um, most of us have probably had the experience when we first wake up in the morning, our mind is just blank. And we're sort of staring at the wall, but we're not recognizing what it is we're seeing. And it takes a minute. We're like, oh, yes, awake now. That's the wall. Those are, that's my laundry on the floor. OK, OK. That moment where we're not thinking, really, and not recognizing anything, that's kind of like bare consciousness. Not exactly. Not exactly. That's the, but that's the best analogy that I can give you. It's, there's awareness there. You're not dead, right? There's awareness there, but there's no recognition or anything. Okay. Again, that's not a perfect analogy, um, but it's kind of like that. So there's just the bare consciousness, right? The bare awareness. And then our habits would be like the habit to um, to respond to things with anger, or to respond to things with compassion. Like personality, like. It's a little bit deeper than personality. Personality it becomes much more specific. So um, your personality might be that you have the habit of getting angry when someone cuts you off in traffic, but not when your sister, um, you know, says you're an idiot or whatever. You know, you can laugh about that. If somebody cuts you off in traffic, and that always sets you off. That's personality. But there's that underlying tendency towards anger. That that's what we're talking about. That's the kind of habit imprint. It's like leaves an impression on the consciousness. <coughs> okay. Other questions? Yes. This is more of the question I asked this. Um, the other day, I went to the other temple, and mm -hmm. after chanting on the sutra. They walk around through the hall and mm -hmm. over the tattoo. Like that is rarely I ever seen in the other temple. So why do they do that? And why some of the temple they don't do that? Uh, okay, so the question is, um, she went to a temple recently, and, and after the chanting, they were they were walking around the temple. And she said some temples do that, some temples don't, and why? What's that about? We we actually do do that here. Um, Friday nights uh, at our normal services, there's a point where we get up and we walk around behind the Buddha statues here and go all the way around the hall at least once. And we'll do that today when we do the walking meditation. We'll walk around uh, that way. And it's considered um, it's considered a meritorious thing to do. It's like it, it helps generate good karma. Um, it's a sign of respect to the enlightened beings. It's the same thing with the bowing. We're not worshiping the Buddhas. Uh, people say this all the time. Well, if Buddha was a man and he was a teacher, then why do you worship him? And I always say, well, we don't worship the Buddha because the Buddha isn't a god. We show respect to the Buddha. We show gratitude to the Buddha. In a very practical sense, the reason why we do things like bowing and chanting and walking around the Buddhas clockwise, that act brings the Buddha to mind. It helps us focus on the Buddha and his teaching. And in so doing, we're creating that habit of keeping the Buddha in mind. Hopefully, even after we leave the temple. If we come to the temple and we bow to the Buddha and we're filled with so much faith and we're chanting and you know it's really intense, and then we leave and we start gossiping with our friends and you know, stealing candy at the store or whatever, that's no good. So the idea of doing any dharma practice um, is to bring the Buddha to mind and to help us hold the Buddha and his teachings in mind so that when we leave the temple or leave our practice space, we will continue with that in mind and then our behavior will change. Does that answer your question? Okay. Yes, go ahead. Um, the dynamic system, I don't feel quite understand that. Can you explain that? Um, when the cause and effect of karma is a dynamic system, I'm thinking like, what, what is a dynamic system? Okay, so um, as I mentioned, she's asking about this explanation of karma as a dynamic system. Uh, I, I refer to it that way for two reasons. One, because it isn't that one cause leads to one effect. 
there are countless causes that lead to countless effects. So it's really difficult for us to determine all the time. Sometimes we can, but it's really difficult for us to determine an exact, uh, an exact line from A to B. For example, if you ask me, what is the karma that led you to be a monk living here at this temple? That would take a hundred years to try and explain. So in that sense, it's a dynamic system. It's also dynamic in that it isn't just A leads to B and then stop. Cause leads to effect, and that's the end. So I experience something, but then I respond to that experience. So my response is an effect, but it, all, it is also a new cause for new karma going forward. Does that make sense? Yeah. Let me double check the time. Oh, actually, the clock on this is off. Can someone tell me what time it is? 345. 10 to 4. 345. Okay. Um, unless there is there any more questions? Maybe one more. No? Okay. Then uh, I'll go ahead and give a brief explanation of uh, the meditation that we do here.